Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, uh, welcome. We're delighted to have all of you with us today. Uh, this is the second half of a two-part program that we've been featuring on uh, you know, civics in America. The focus, though, is on how racial injustice has affected national security. Um, <clears throat> if I could just step back to say, you know, the uh, the Constitution has these very, very inspiring words, uh, all men are created equal. And when they wrote those words, that's what they meant. They meant men. They didn't mean all people. They meant all men were. As a matter of fact, they didn't mean all men. They only meant all white men were created equal. Not of that, only white men who owned property were considered equal. And that was the starting point. But the words transcended the, the meaning of that cultural limitation. Um, people around the world, people in America saw an opportunity. Black men and women saw the opportunity for a greater life. They picked up arms and fought for America, for a bigger world, a better world. Women who didn't have a right to vote uh, were given an opportunity to fight for a better America, a real America. So over years, that very narrow framework, um, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, turned into the real meaning. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal. Now, that, that doesn't mask the profound unfairness and bigotry in American society. And we've been struggling with that, fighting with that every step of the way. Um, America has been strongest when it recognized its own failings and it addressed them and it became a bigger nation for it. And that's what we're going to explore today. We're going to talk about national security as it reflects the, the our domestic construction, honesty, opportunity, fairness for everybody in America. That's the foundation of this conversation today. <clears throat> Suzanne Spalding, I want to thank you for organizing it. We've got a superb group that's going to lead this conversation. I very much look forward to hearing everybody. I've, I've, I've never learned anything by talking. I only learn from listening. So I'm going to turn to all of you, and I look forward to listening to you. John, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Dr. Hamry has been such a wonderful, strong supporter of our program from the very beginning. And uh, most importantly, John, I want to thank you for your really lifelong commitment to uh, upholding and living by the shared values that are reflected in our Constitution and all that you do to help sustain our democracy. So thank you very much and thanks for those opening remarks. Welcome uh, all of you and, and for those of you who were uh, fortunate enough to be part of our event yesterday, welcome back. As Dr. Hamry said, this is part two of a two-part series a discussion on civics as a national security imperative addressing racial injustice. This program is part of a broader strategic dialogue initiative that is designed to bring together na national security experts and experts in civic education and civic engagement to develop strategies for reinvigorating civic education and civic engagement in our country in order to make our nation stronger. We are so grateful to Craig Newmark, Craig Newmark Philanthropies for funding this broader strategic dialogue initiative. I'm Suzanne Spaulding. I am the director of the Strategic Dialogue and of the Defending Democratic Institutions Project in the International Security Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. 
Yesterday's terrific program is now posted on the CSIS events page. So if you did miss it, I hope you'll go back after this and take advantage of the opportunity to watch it. It was really a terrific group of national security experts who were talking about from their perspective as national security practitioners and experts, uh, the national security implications of race, of systemic racism and really the national security threat that it, that it Im imposes. Um, we had a great group. We were uh, kicked off by a former Secretary of Homeland Security, Jay Johnson, um, who talked about from his perspective, uh, the importance of addressing these issues. Uh, and I'll just give one of his uh, quote from his terrific remarks. If anybody asks me, is civic engagement important in bringing about social change? My answer is a resounding and unequivocal yes. Uh, we had Kyron Skinner, Dr. Skinner, uh, who was the Director for Policy and Planning in the State Department in this current administration up until August of 2019. Uh, and she also talked about, from her perspective, uh, it, you know, man, looking at uh, our international relations, um, but more broadly as well. She said the historical pattern in, of the U.S. is that every time we take on the problem of African Americans in this country, we come out stronger. We also had Elizabeth Rinskoff Parker, my mentor, friend, and uh, who has been a terrific advisor along with the American Bar Association Standing Committee on Law and National Security collaborator on this uh, project from the very beginning. Uh, and she brought not only her national security background as former general counsel of CIA and NSA, but also her experience as Deputy Director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under the law and a cooperating attorney with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Um, Elizabeth has been very focused on the civics piece of this. She talked about the importance of assessing civic education in the same way we assess STEM topics. Treat civics, history, geography, those civic topics in the same way that we treat all of the STEM topics, require the same period periodicity in terms of assessing and report on a state by state level. She said, yes, it's an imperfect union. We should be striving for a perfect union, but if we don't understand it and we don't appreciate what it has done so far, how to improve it becomes a very challenging prospect. And finally, we had Wendy Parker, who is the national security advisor to the speaker of the US House of Representatives who uh, gave some really wonderful impassioned uh, words on the topic of the national security and civic education. Uh, just one quote, it has been over the years, the perseverance and determination of the American people that has led to change in this country. America has been a beacon of light, a beacon of hope, a standard bearer. And I'm so proud to say that about my country. If we're going to ensure we need to maintain and promote our values. So that gives you just a tease uh, to go and watch the entire program. And I wanna thank Elizabeth Rinskoff Parker, along with uh, Ted McConnell, the Civic Mission for the Education uh, in our schools, and Louise Dubay with iCivics for helping put together today's outstanding panel. We're gonna shift today to hear from our civic uh, education and empowerment experts. Uh, and, and let me introduce them. Danielle Allen is the James Bryant Conant University Professor at Harvard University and the director of its Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics, working extensively on political and democratic theory, political sociology, and the history of political thought. She's published numerous works. She's also the principal investigator for the Democratic Knowledge Project, former chair of the Mellon Foundation Board and a past chair of the Pulitzer Prize Board. And just last week, congratulations, Danielle, the Library of Congress named Dr. Allen as the 2020 recipient of the prestigious John W. Kluge Prize for Achievement in the Study of Humanity. Sean Healy is the program director of the Robert R. McCormick Foundation Democracy Program which fosters the civic development of the next generation of individuals, communities, and governmental systems in Illinois. 
Dr. Healy recently chaired the Illinois Task Force on Civic Education and led the successful push for a required high school civics course in the state of Illinois. He also led the Illinois Social Science Standards Task Force in 2014 and 2015 and served as a social studies teacher in Wisconsin and Illinois before coming to McCormick. So firsthand experience with the issues we're talking about. Amber Coleman Mortley is the Director of Social Engagement at iCivics, where she works to recruit teacher influencers, elevate diverse perspectives in civic education, and manage the Civics Now Youth Fellowship. Ms. Coleman Mortley is also an NBC Parent Toolkit expert and runs the blog Mom of All Capes, and that's all one word, you want to look it up, Mom of All Capes where she covers parent strategies in ed tech, civic education, parent-teacher partnerships, and social-emotional development. Prior to joining iCivics, Ms. Coleman-Mortley worked as a teacher and a coach at Sidwell Friends School. Andrew Wilkes is the Generation Citizens Senior Director of Policy and Advocacy, where he leads the thought leadership, coalition building, and policy initiatives. Mr. Wilkes previously served as the executive director of the Drum Major Institute, a social change organization founded by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In this role, Mr. Wilkes established the Beloved Community Initiative and relaunched the Marketplace of Ideas Forum, a forum for bringing policy ideas to an audience of change makers, policy professionals, and nonprofit leaders. He also worked positions at the American Red Cross of Greater New York and Habitat for Humanity. So welcome all of our panelists. We're very excited to have all of you here and very grateful. I wanna to start today uh, with this group of civic education experts by asking you about national security. Our national security experts yesterday were bold enough to venture into your territory of civic education and engagement. Uh, and so I'm gonna ask you to do the same today. From your perspective, as folks who have been working for so many years in the trenches on this issue of these issues around civic education and civic empowerment. Sean Healy, I wanna start with you uh, and, and hear your perspective from the Robert R. McCormick uh, Democracy Program perspective. I know that uh, I, back in the 90s, I used to uh, do a lot of national security programming with the McCormick Foundation. And, uh, and, and I know that they're, they're clearly very engaged in civic projects as well. So from your perspective, how do you see the national security aspect of this? Well, thanks for that question, Suzanne, and, and most of all for this opportunity and uh, just a, a real honor to, to be with this uh, prestigious group and congratulations on a fantastic uh, panel yesterday. Uh, my, specifically, I'd, I'd, I'd touch on a few things in response to your question, uh, once again, being more of a, a civic education expert than a national security expert. Uh, but if, if I could suggest, one, uh, this issue of mis- and disinformation, uh, and specifically uh, around the need for media literacy. And my refrain here is going to be, there are tremendous opportunities in schools to address these issues, but unfortunately in too many places, we're falling short. Uh, mis and disinformation is one of them. Media literacy is a big opportunity. Uh, it's part of a good civic education, but we know that even some of our brightest students, Stanford students, for example, the most selective uh, university in the country, uh, fail basic tests of media literacy. Uh, their teachers are at a bit of a loss of how to uh, teach media literacy. There's a sense that young people, because they're so comfortable with technology, are actually good at sorting through mis and disinformation. They're not. There's a tremendous need to do that well. Clearly, mis and disinformation is a threat to our national security. There are also deep societal cleavages. Uh, as we know, by many empirical measures, we're more polarized uh, than we've been at any time in this country since the Civil War. Uh, once again, tremendous opportunity in schools. Schools are actually the most ideological diver ideologically diverse place that many of us will ever occupy. And young people are actually in the process of forming their views. What a great place to teach them uh, how to have conversations about the critical issues of the, of the day that our democracy is struggling to solve. 
Uh, also, deep distrust of government, uh, a threat to our national security, deep distrust uh, of one another. Uh, and that, that too, uh, is baked into a system, a system where many of our schools, frankly, are run undemocratically, even in an authoritarian style. Uh, often, as we talk about the climate of schools, as we talk about how students are punished, there's huge disproportionality and punishment that leads to distrust. And of course, that falls unevenly to the topic of today's conversation based on students' race and ethnicity. And then overlaying all of that, uh, the quality and quantity of civic education that students receive is fundamentally, fundamentally inequitable uh, by race and ethnicity. So it's a fundamentally different experience uh, for students of color, not just uh, between schools, but even within the, the, the same school. Uh, so collectively, these are all national security threats. They're frankly rooted in our civic education system. Uh, there is a, a, an affirmative role for schools to play in resolving them. And I'm, I'm uh, very hopeful that this conversation, uh, the, the focus on this issue at the moment, uh, allows us to lean into them and help resolving them. Yeah, terrific. Thank you, Sean. And I should add, uh, for those uh, who are watching, uh, we encourage you to be thinking about questions for these terrific panelists. Uh, and you can ask questions. There's an Ask Questions Live button on the CSIS event page. So just click on that and type in your question and, and they will be fed to me and I will ask them of our panelists. So thank you. Um, Danielle, Sean uh, talked about the threat from myths and disinformation. And this is an issue uh, that near and dear to my heart, if you will, I've spent the last three years looking at the ways in which our adversaries are uh, seizing upon legitimate grievances and weaknesses of our own making to undermine public trust and confidence in our institutions, including our justice system and particularly our justice system. Um, but as we've looked at that, uh, it's clear that a key objective there is to undermine the informed and engaged citizenry that is absolutely essential for a healthy democracy. Right, to, co to convince Americans that the system is not just flawed and needing change, but that it is irrevocably broken in order to, to get people to disengage and to despair, to get them to give up on the idea of being informed by, uh, by convincing them there are no reliable sources of information. Right? Um, and these are fundamental uh, aspects of our democracy that I think civic education can address, uh, but they have very real implications for our security. And when we talk about national security, we also bring in, of course, homeland security. And it's hard to talk about these issues without bringing in COVID-19, uh, particularly in light of the really devastating uh, dis disparate impact that that disease has had, both in terms of mortality uh, but also in terms of economics, economic impact. And I know you've done a lot of work uh, and recently were part of a bipartisan group that looked at how we build resilience in the, in the context of COVID-19. You've also written eloquently about the importance of a common purpose. How do you think about these issues from a security perspective? Thanks so much, Suzanne. So COVID is important. There's a lot to be said about health inequities, the pandemic has gained a foothold in this country because of the inequitable access to healthcare that characterizes um, our country. But I'm actually gonna put that aside because Dr. Hamray said some things I think were very important and they connect with the theme of misinformation. I wanna pick up that theme. Dr. Hamray made the point that we need a country that focuses on honesty, opportunity, and fairness. Honesty is the key term. We are vulnerable to misinformation and disinformation because we don't actually ourselves engage honestly with our own history. That is one of our deepest struggles. We often talk about inequities and achievement gaps. And we often, when we think about that, think about the achievement gaps of lack of access for minority students to the same educational opportunities as others have. But the truth is there's an achievement gap that goes the other way around, which is that white students very often don't have the same access to honest history as African-American students and other minority students. I'm just gonna give you one concrete example. And I wanna come back also to the history of the Declaration of Independence that Dr. Hamray started us out with. Um, so I've been very fortunate to talk all over the country for the last few years to 
civic educators to students thinking about civics. And there was something that I learned that really took me aback. Um, it was a bigger phenomenon than I had anticipated. I was on one panel where a young man um, shared that it wasn't until he was 12 or 13 that he learned that George Washington was an enslaver. And at that point that he learned that his hero was an enslaver, his entire faith in this country crumbled. This was a young white man, all right? Now, there's no African-American kid in this country who doesn't know before they can remember that George Washington was an enslaver. I cannot remember when I learned about slavery. That is a memory that predates my ability to remember. I love my country. I was able to reconcile the negative and the positive from a very early age. White students often don't have access to that opportunity because the history is hidden. The dark history is hidden. But there's another issue of how that feeds into distrust because let's imagine you're in a fifth grade classroom and you have to teach about enslavement because you're teaching about the early American Republic. And you've got a bunch of kids who are African-Americans. They already know about enslavement. <laughs> I promise you they do. You have a bunch of white kids who may or may not. Some do, some don't. But if you can't tell the full story then, right from that moment, your African-American students think they're being lied to. All right? They hear lies. They hear cover-up. And that is seeds of distrust. So fifth grade is our turning point moment for learning how to tell a story of the history of our country that integrates the good and the bad and gives all kids a chance to process that so we can understand our potential, our resources, our aspirations, our failings, our crimes, and understand our personal responsibility to overcome those together. So we need honest stories and empowering stories. So I wanna go back to the words of the Declaration of Independence that Dr. Hamry started with, not the Constitution, the Declaration. And because they're important, in fact, there were people in 1776 who understood men to mean everybody. They were already arguing about that. By January of 1777, free African-American Prince Hall used those very words to submit a petition for abolition in Massachusetts. And by the early 1780s, slavery had been ended in Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, and Vermont. We have had two traditions from the beginning, and we need to tell that whole history. We need to see the agency of African-Americans from the beginning and white allies, James Otis, absolutely meant all people are created equal when he was arguing in the 1760s. He's the person who gave us no taxation without representation. He also gave us a very powerful anti-slavery argument. So the history is richer and deeper than we often tell. We all deserve honesty. There's an achievement gap, I think, for white kids who don't get exposed to that honesty. Terrific, really valuable perspective, Danielle, thank you. Amber, uh, how do you see this from the, you know, your your position with uh, with iCivics, and and you know, can you address uh, Danielle's point as well about the different ways in which uh, our children in America learn about their history? Yeah, uh, so my role at iCivics, um, I spend a lot of time listening, so listening to educator communities, listening to our student communities, um, also listening to parent communities, right, um, and. There is a, there, to Daniel's point, there are a lot of people who experience our justice system, experience a variety of our systems in different ways, right? And so, you know, we need to kind of rectify that. Uh, we need to ensure that all of us are standing on the side of justice. Um, you know, when people lose faith in the system, the system begins to crumble. Um, so we want to make sure that we are educating our students and educating the, the general public um, to strengthen our democracy, to, you know, assure them that this system works. Democracy is a beautiful experience. It is an experiment. It is not a finite thing that happens to you. Um, and we need to uh, impress upon everyone that we need people to participate in that system. But we also need to do the work to address the disparities within the system so that when we send impact people in, that system is ready for them to engage, right? Also making sure that people who are already engaged in that system understand that new voices that come in are valuable and necessary uh, to keep the democracy moving and going. So, you know, my role at iCivics is to help us get kids, you know, engaged and ready to go, but also working toward, you know, where are the places in our democracy that we can uh, fix to ensure that once we send empowered people out there, that that, that system's ready for them. Yeah, terrific. Um, so, uh, Andrew, you're, you're uh, a big part of your focus there at uh, Next Generation Citizen. 
uh, is this empowerment, right? A big part of our push on civic education engagement is to empower young people. Uh, Amber makes the point that that's not enough. We also need to uh, in our systems are ready to interact, interact perspective on this from, from uh, Thanks, Suzanne, uh, and appreciate Amber making that, that point uh, as well. Um, I first, just really want to uh, thank CSIS for having this conversation. I think it's a really rich one. Uh, what I note is in order for students to be uh, empowered and to have an environment that's conducive to empowerment, uh, I think it's important for school culture to prefigure and anticipate in some ways the political culture that we want to shape. Uh, in far too many instances, um, school climate and school discipline in particular uh, leads to expulsion, uh, suspension, and other disciplinary policies that disproportionately uh, fall hardest on students of color. Uh, and when that happens, schools, instead of being a place of safety and curiosity, uh, can become a place of civic disjuncture, where the type of trust and positive association we might want students to have with our public institutions across the board uh, become something of an admixture between partly positive associations and partly um, less savory associations, I'll put it that way. So having school cultures be democratic helps to build a bridge to the wider uh, political culture um, being democratic as well. Great, yep, terrific. So um, having that environment and that experience at an early age, uh, not just hearing about it, but living it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, John, uh, uh, what do you think are some of the barriers to achieving uh, and closing some of the gaps that, that we've been hearing about here in terms of um, more robust uh, civic education, but also, you know, getting a curricula change so that we have a shared history? Um, what, what, you know, many of all of you have been working at this for quite some time. And uh, what, what, are the, what are the barriers? What are the things in our way? Sure. So uh, I can speak uh, with most credibility to the work that we've done in Illinois. And we've, we've uh, gained some recognition for some of our policy achievements, which include uh, civics course requirements for high school and starting this fall middle school. We've also revised our state standards. And uh, since, since the mid-O's, since 2006, have been running a statewide program called Democracy Schools. And it's fair to say each of those policies was driven uh, with best practices and civics in mind. And there's a relative consensus in the field about how we teach civics. Of course, there's a place for direct instruction on government institutions, but then it's important to complement that with student-centered practices like, like Andrew just discussed, action civics, talk to kids about controversial issues, simulate democratic processes. So our, our policies have embedded that, uh, but unfortunately, uh, they didn't approach uh, this issue from a race equity perspective. We didn't do that analysis. Uh, so I, I think it's really important that we do that moving forward. Uh, one thing that we've done is uh, support the publication of something called a Live Civics Framework. And I think it really speaks uh, to what Danielle was talking about in her piece, uh, where, where young people uh, can see themselves in our civics curriculum. Uh, I think too often uh, we haven't done that. We've also embedded those principles uh, in, in our democracy schools program now. So it's one of the things that we measure. I brought up earlier also the, the issue of uh, exclusionary discipline in schools, the school to prison pipeline, uh, how it disproportionately impacts students of color, black males in particular. That's something that we have to address. The capacity, frankly, of teachers to do this work, all the aforementioned work uh, is quite limited at the moment. Uh, like so many other fields, like the law, for example, uh, there, there's a huge diversity challenge uh, amongst teachers. It's most pronounced uh, actually in the social studies. Uh, it's, it's actually not just a stereotype. Uh, the social studies are the cradle of football coaches. I'm a former one of those. Uh, so uh, lots of work to be done there. So addressing that school to prison pipeline, uh, seeing schools as mini polities, uh, where we can model democracy, 
instead of authoritarian practices and model justice as it relates uh, to student discipline. It's really a place that we think restorative practices uh, should prevail and an opportunity for students to see themselves in this great experiment in democracy. Yeah, terrific. You know, you mentioned that preparing our teachers, uh, schools of education, the you know places that teachers are taught, uh, have to be an, an integral part of this conversation. Um, Danielle, you you know you you talk about needing to make sure that white children uh, you know understand our full history, that they are told the true story, uh, the good and the bad. These are controversial issues. If you're going to really engage, as we are talking about today, um, teachers need to be prepared for how to have those conversations. Um, you, you know, you talk a lot about common purpose, the importance of a of common purpose, and what a valuable toolkit that is for democracy. Uh, having getting to a common purpose requires, I think what you're saying is having a common history, a common sense of that history. What do you think are the biggest barriers here? I think you've said it very well, Suzanne. Um, having the capacity to find a common purpose in a moment of crisis, for example, in this COVID context, um, is easier if we have a shared history that we can connect to, and if we have a full sort of shared respect for one another's honesty. Right, so that's, that's kind of bedrock. We need that for a healthy democracy. And I do think this gets to the heart of the matter. If we look at policy and the kind of policy that has affected how much time in schools there is for civic education and how many resources there are for civic education, polarization around our history is the number one obstacle. So we just have to roll back time to go back to the early 2000s when the National Governors Association was working on trying to develop the Common Core State Standards. And when they set out on that project, the intention was to establish standards for STEM education, for English language arts, and for social studies. And for all of those of you who may have had kids passing through school in the last decade, you'll know your kids never got tested in social studies. They only succeeded in delivering the first two categories of standards. The result of not delivering social studies standards was that time has fallen away for social studies. We spend our time on the subjects that we're held accountable for. Now, why did they fail to deliver those social studies standards? It was very straightforwardly because of polarization and an inability to agree on how we narrate American history. So we're sort of stuck in the words of the historian Jill Lepore between the sort of folks who advocate for the glory story, all the, the history of the triumphs and achievements, and those who focus on the gory story, enslavement, displacement, and genocide of Native Americans, and so forth. Both of these things are truths of our history. So the challenge is, it's a design challenge we have to recognize, is how we can tell both sides of the story simultaneously and process both sides together. I am using the vocabulary of psychology intentionally. We actually have a co-processing job to do as a society. And the goal should be that, you know, the design challenge is how do we tell our history in a way that is honest about the crimes and the wrongs, but without falling into cynicism. That honesty has to be connected to empowerment and empowering stories of agency, overcoming, and resilience. And similarly, we have to tell the stories of accomplishments, the great achievements of this country, but without tipping into deification, because nothing is perfect. It is an imperfect union, and it falls to every generation to improve. There is a progressive commitment, and I mean that in a broad sense, not a political sense, built into the Declaration of Independence, where every citizen is invited to consider is the government securing its rights? And if not, to alter it, to lay the foundation on such principles and organize the powers of government in such form as to we the people shall see most likely to affect our safety and happiness. So that's an ongoing request, invitation to Americans to participate in judgment and understanding and improvement. So yes, we need to recognize our accomplishments, but not in such a way that we think that they are baked in stone once and forever as perfected creations. So honest without cynicism, but empowering, and appreciative, but not deifying of our past. So there is room for constant improvement. Um, that's the goal. Those are the parameters of our design challenge for our curriculum. Yeah, that's terrific, Danielle. And it reminds me of, uh, you know, I, I often think about to raise a controversial subject, the national anthem uh, starts, but a lot of people don't focus on the fact that it starts and ends with a question, right? So it asks at the beginning, does the, you know, can you see the flag? I would say, can you see? 
Uh, and then it tells the story of through the night as the bombs were bursting, we could see it, we could make it out with the, you know, in the light of the, of the blast. But now morning is dawning and it's gotten quiet and we don't know, does the flag still fly over the uh, land of the free and the home of the brave? And it's a question mark. It's not a, doesn't end with the chest thumping, you know, we are the greatest country in the world. It ends with this question mark, does the flag still fly? And I think it is a challenge to each of us, as you say, to continue this ongoing uh, experiment, right? And to get it right. Um, it is so difficult, I think, to find that bipartisan approach. How optimistic are you that, that we can overcome what has sadly become often a partisan conversation around that curriculum in our schools? Well, I'll tell you, I've been so fortunate over the last year to participate with a huge network of partners um, led by iCivics, uh, Louise Dubé being the, the ringleader, um, a project called Educating for American Democracy. Um, it's funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities and Department of Education. And we have the job of delivering a roadmap for history and civics education K through 12 for the country. And we have worked really intentionally and self-consciously to build a cross ideological uh, you know, cross-partisan group of people working together. And we've really pushed ourselves and tested ourselves and had lots of hard conversations. We've found compromises. Um, so for example, there's a long running argument even about whether we are a democracy or a republic. Well, we've compromised in our roadmap, we focus on the fact that we're a constitutional democracy that gets to the structure that comes from the republic concept. It gets to the people empowerment part that comes from the democracy concept. So we're doing education for constitutional democracy we can't answer all questions as a group convening together in this cross ideological and cross partisan way. And that's why we've really tried to put the frame around design challenges. And again, the one I articulated about our history is a design challenge. Every school district in the country, every educator needs to engage with that design challenge about how to tell that honest, about not cynical, appreciative, uh, but not deifying story of our past. And that if we can do that together, participate in the sense of facing the same challenge, my belief is that we'll break through to finding a common purpose. So if we're not at a common purpose yet, let's at least agree on the same challenge and dig into that one together. It's always a good start. Uh, Amber, iCivics, uh, as, as uh, Danielle uh, talked about, is we've, we've talked a lot about the sort of K through 12, right, conversations and education that needs to happen. And we've got to train that uh, that generation. But, uh, but it, this is really a broader conversation, isn't it? And um, how do we think about uh, jumpstarting the civic education of our older population as well? All of us, um, all of us, uh, those of us who, who no longer are in school. Yeah, so I, I will speak to Danielle's design challenge. As a gaming company, we, we wrestle with design challenges all the time. Um, you know, on one hand, we have to be brave enough to pursue this work, right? Um, we have to, as the adults, who are in this ecosystem, you know, have the bravery to jump in and, and kind of like lead the work and do it, which is great that we are. Um, you know, I'll give one example of iCivics, right? We have the game Race to Ratify, where we, you know, force or not force, challenge our players to be an anti-federalist or federalist, you know, and they're trying to ratify the constitution. Um, we put a lot of work into the research um, about the voices who were present during that time. You know, this was funded by the, the National Endowment of Humanities as well. Um, so we put a lot of time and effort into finding the voices that are not the usual suspects during that time to, you know, kind of embed the gamer in the history of that of, of that experience. You know, we, we speak to women, we speak to indigenous people, we speak to, you know, free Africans, we speak to enslaved people, you know, uh, we speak to non-landowning whites, right? So throughout that game, you're, you're learning about the voices of a variety of people and learning the history and the, 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 the ideas that people had about this very historic moment in time. So we're pushing the needle on whose voices are important and getting this very important thing passed. Um, and then on the other hand, you know, we need to evolve civics such that, you know, these are, this is an experience that, you know, gets people to have conversations with each other. Because at the root of civic education is civil discourse and conversation. We want people to bring their perspective to the table, but be able to listen to other people's perspectives. So we need to evolve civic education to, to kind of get to the root of that. Yeah, terrific. Uh, Andrew, what uh, your your focus is on that uh, um, generation that is action 
civics education, uh, civic education. Um, so the broader population beyond just the K through 12? That's, that's an excellent question. I, I think a part of that, that work uh, entails really making sure that we're doing uh, some of the field building and um, public narrative shaping work that can engage an audience beyond those who are stakeholders in schools. And a part of the work that we're doing at Generation Citizen uh, alongside iCivics and a great group of uh, organizations across the country is leading uh, an equity and in civics initiative, uh, which brings together researchers, uh, civic education practitioners, social emotional learning experts. And we're trying to figure out how can we uh, focus on these challenges in a way that uh, mobilizes people within schools for sure, but also engages people from the surrounding communities. And a part of uh, one of the flagship components of that effort uh, has been a listening tour that we're uh, that we kicked off in Harvest, Harvest Alabama uh, pre-COVID. Uh, and now, of course, all of the uh, in-person events have had to uh, shuffle to an online and virtual format. Uh, and so we're looking to organize conversations with folks from Chicago to Waco and Austin, Texas, to uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, to Memphis, Tennessee, so that we have the experiences and their insights uh, as resources in addressing this design challenge of uh, centering racial equity in civics education. Yeah, terrific. You all are engaged in such um, meaningful and, and really creative uh, efforts in this area. And uh, uh, so, so it's clear what your organizations and each of you as individuals are trying to do to advance this. Um, I, I, I want to uh, what this last question for all of you before we turn to our audience questions, which are coming in. Uh, I want to ask you what else, what is, what is the most important sort of next step if you were talking to uh, our government, um, but equally important as you talk to the folks who are watching this program. Uh, we've talked a lot about the importance of individual engagement and individuals understanding their role in a democracy um, do, do you have some thoughts on, uh, Andrew, on, on, on steps, concrete things that particularly individuals can do to advance this? Great question. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is that I think we can support um, advocating for policies, particularly at the state level, which lift up uh, comprehensive civics education. Uh, and that's work that um, Generation Citizen, iCivics, and a number of other folks are doing through the Civics Now coalition and the opportunity to raise our hand and get involved in the political process so that students can not only uh, learn how the system works and get excited about it, uh, but really move towards uh, a full participation political culture, despite some of the um, inherited policy legacies of uh, systemic racism that we're talking about today. Yeah, great. Amber? Yeah, I would second that, you know, uh, fund civic education, right? Um, get behind high quality civic education standards. Um, you know, I highly recommend everyone check out the CivX Now uh, site. We have 10 policy recommendations that you could look at as a starting point to guide you in the right direction, um, but fund civic education. And then everyone play some games and like learn about civics as a problem solving vehicle. Great, John. If I could just uh, echo my colleagues, uh, been uh, proud to be part of the Civics Now Coalition. Andrew and I are, are chairing a, a state uh, task force, and we have a comprehensive policy menu that, that both Andrew and Amber referenced. Uh, I'd like to point specifically to the issue of uh, measurement and, and accountability. Uh, I think civic learning needs to be embedded uh, in state accountability systems. Uh, we also need to look, as I suggested earlier, at issues of school climate and student disciplinary data and disaggregate that data by race and ethnicity. That's a way to, to, to really uh, shine a light on inequities and force our systems to respond to them. Uh, if I could also echo at the national level what, what Elizabeth Rins Rinskoff Parker said yesterday, uh, and you, you mentioned at, at the top, Suzanne, uh, NAEP, uh, NAEP Civics. Uh, is something that has been deprioritized. Uh, we will have had a 29 year, or excuse me, a 19 year gap in testing 12th graders in civics. And we don't uh, test a large enough sample 
where we can disaggregate this data by state. Uh, so that's that's a huge priority at the national level. And then uh, echoing Amber, uh, this field is severely undercapitalized. It's a field led uh, by organizations like iCivics and Generation Citizen. They're doing yeoman work, uh, but but frankly, we need exponential uh, investments in this field, and that's only going to come uh, through national support. So it's 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 really critical to get to that next level to support more students and teachers in schools and districts. Uh, we need much more capitalization of this field. Yeah, great and really important point. Danielle, what, what do you think would be most important sort of next concrete steps? I'll echo what my colleagues have said. I'm glad Amber spelled out CivX now because I was going to say give to CivX now, number one. Um, it's a field leading organization. It's built a huge coalition. Um, it's really an extraordinary high integrity organization and deserves people's support. And my number two suggestion would be write to your governor and your state secretary of education and tell them how important you think more time on social studies and civic education is. Make sure they hear that message over and over again from as many of your friends as you can muster. Great. All right, there you go. Those of you who are watching, you have your marching orders. You're, you're energized as you should be by this conversation to do something. Uh, so we've got some questions here. Um, a, a, a question about media literacy. Sean, you mentioned particularly media literacy, but all of you touched on it. Um, media literacy actually in civic education, uh, what role does that play? And how can civics help restore public trust in information or uh, in, um, um, around public affairs? And how can we help citizens both care about and be able to evaluate the veracity of information? Again, this goes to the the importance of an informed citizenry. I'll weigh in, but I'm, I'm by no means the expert here. Uh, our foundation has been investing in uh, this area for, for quite some time. Uh, the legacy of my foundation is uh, in journalism. Uh, we're the benefactor, Robert McCormick, who uh, was the editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune. Uh, so we've been particularly concerned about the decline of newspapers, uh, the huge uh, challenges facing the media industry on, on the revenue side, and uh, thought some of those early investments on kind of the demand side of the equation uh, could help reverse that decline. Uh, we, we've been mostly in error uh, in that sense, but there, there has been this proliferation of information. There's some real good uh, reasons for optimism in terms of uh, the nonprofit uh, media ecosystem. But that's a long way of saying uh, th there's always been an affirmative role uh, for schools to play in developing the news attentiveness of young people. Uh, that is part of a good civic education. Uh, news attentiveness is part of being a, a good citizen. Uh, as I said in my earlier comments, we have a long ways to go as a system in terms of how we do that. Uh, this isn't something that just lives in a single class, in a single semester long civics class, which is how we do this in most of the country. It literally has to embed, be embedded in what we do K-12 across the curriculum. Uh, encourage you to all look at the work happening in New York right now. There was a publication, I believe, that just came out a week or two ago, uh, led, led by the task force looking at this issue in New York, uh, Michael Rebell out of Columbia University, uh, the principal author, but makes the case for media literacy and puts forth a, a pathway for how we do that, how we embed that K-12 across the curriculum. Terrific. Great. Thanks for that. Tip. Anybody else want to address the issue of media literacy? Okay. We've got a, uh, another question about um, that is related. What resources are available to teachers to help students uh, prepare for informed, safe, digital citizenship? I'll take that one. Oh, Great. Cool. You can go ahead, Danielle. Okay, um, so <laughs> we, I'll say that iCivics, because I'm partial, we have a variety of uh, resources to help with that. Um, speaking specifically like to media literacy, we do have a game Newsfeed Defenders, um, where students have to, you know, um, moderate their own social media-like platform where they're pu pulling out the misinformation and disinformation and then putting in the new positive and good information uh, in that to keep 
to keep it going. So I would definitely, you know, encourage educators to check out Newsfeed Defenders. Um, we also have a lot of lesson plans uh, that are also um, helpful with teaching uh, these skills. Um, so I'll just drop that plug in there. Excellent. I'll throw in a plug too. There's a terrific resource called the Digital Civics Toolkit, which is a collaboration between University of California Riverside and Project Zero at Harvard's Graduate School of Education. Um, so there's the iCivics example, there's the Digital Civics Toolkit. There are actually a huge number of resources now available and also many resources on media literacy. Stanford's uh, Shag Group has been doing terrific media literacy work. So at this point, the good news is the field knows how to deliver this kind of instruction. We need time in school, people. <laughs> All right, that's the number one most important thing we need. Finding room in the in the day, right. Yep, yep. Um, so we've got a, a really good sort of basic question and uh, I, 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 that I'm sympathetic to. I will say when I started working on this uh, strategic dialogue and and interacting more uh, frequently with folks in your field. Um, I noticed that some people talk about civics and some people talk civics education and some people talk about civic education. Uh, and we've got a question here about what is the actual definition of civics? Um, is there a broadly accepted sort of operational definition? Do we need a new definition? Uh, is there a new definition we should use? This is probably longer conversation than we have time for this afternoon but but <laughs> I, I think I, I think it it's it's a good conversation it, it's part partly I would say semantics uh, as I ref if I, as I said earlier the field over the last couple of decades under the leadership of Ted McConnell and the campaign for the civic mission of schools has coalesced around best practices some of those I identified earlier uh, more recently uh, thanks to a convening that, that civics now and I civics did in 2017. Uh, we put forth some supplementary practices uh, like media literacy, uh, issues of school climate. Um, so I, I think we have a sense of what works, uh, the terminology of how we actually describe it. There's some good debates about that. And then obviously, as, as Danielle said earlier, uh, a real ideological uh, battle here in terms of what good civic education looks like. Maybe it's because I'm a centrist, but I see it as kind of a both and uh, type of solution. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the, the terminology itself uh, is a matter of debate, but I think the, the field has coalesced around what good civic learning looks like. I think I would uh, think that that about and kind of person too. Go ahead, Danielle. <laughs> Well, just to say, but I think across the field, what you'll find is that there's agreement that civic education consists of a body of content knowledge, um, a body of socio-emotional learning, and a body of skills development. Um, but it really takes all three, knowledge, SEL, um, capacities and dispositions, and skills. So pulling the package together is the objective. Excellent. Andrew, did you want to weigh in on this? The, the one thing that I'd add in, in light of the focus of uh, this conversation, I think too often, though not always, the civics education field talks about uh, the procedures, how to understand and how to get engaged in democracy uh, in a race neutral and sometimes a historical sort of way. And so I think it's important to make sure that um, when we, that civics education begins to conceive itself in some ways as um, a reparative discipline, which helps students to solve challenges that they identify in their community. They can take perspectives and view those problems differently, but rather than viewing civics education as something that happens in a vacuum, really embedding it in the environment and the legacies that various communities have as students are prepared to get engaged in our democracy. Yeah, great. So I'm gonna combine a couple questions for this, um, probably our last question uh, today. Um, one of our uh, viewers asked, you know, education is important, but it feels like change will take a long time. Uh, how can we look to make immediate change? And I think a related question is, you know, that we see lots of discouraging uh, signs. We see, you know, these surveys that shows, you know, how uh, illiterate so many Americans are about basic issues around our, our governance and government and uh, what signs of hope do you see, which I think is a good way for us to close out the day. So 
So, you know, what can we do? What are the things we can do in the near term to, to try to bring about some immediate change? And what are the signs of hope that you see? I'll go. Um, I speak with my own children in my own home about this all the time. We, we are hope seekers. Um, and just the, the sheer idea that people are coming out, especially right now in this moment, you know, forming cross-racial and cross-cultural coalitions to solve these problems. You know, we were driving down the street and we saw so many white people with signs that said Black Lives Matter. We saw, you know, Asian people with signs that said Black Lives Matter and Black people, Indigenous people. Like, it was just really beautiful. And I think, you know, even though it's a, there's a lot of despair in this moment, we do need to make sure that we don't forget that a lot of people are standing on the side of justice. Great. Who wants to go next? I, I thought Sean was uh, going to go next, but uh, I think I saw Sean mute. So I'll, I'll go on then, uh, Sean, Sean uh, happy to pass to you. Um, one of um, my favorite quotes, and it's perhaps uh, uh, par for the course in the civic field, sometimes to quote Martin Luther King Jr., but he, he has a quote where he talks about uh, carving a stone of hope out of the mountain of despair. And when we think about um, racial injustice, certainly uh, we could think of a mountain of despair, but what gives me something of that, that stone of hope is looking at how many of the folks on this call have helped to pass uh, civics education laws together in Massachusetts, in Utah, and are trying to mobilize and support work already happening on the ground to, to do the same. So here's to more ripples of hope across the country. Excellent. Yeah, well, the work of all, each of you uh, that you're doing is indeed a great sign of hope. Sean? Or, uh, if I could pick up on what Andrew said in specific to state policy, we have given some of the changes we've seen in Illinois. Uh, one, we've seen schools and districts and teachers implement our laws with fidelity. And then we've seen co commiserate student outcomes uh, across race and ethnicity that, that are favorable. So policy change uh, can produce favorable outcomes. I often talk about civics uh, as a generational solution. So some of the impact uh, is going to be seen over a long period of time. But then I think it's uh, very important to point to the moment, uh, as, as Amber did, a lot of the young people that we're teaching that are still in our classrooms are out there doing this good work right now. So uh, it's, it's not just a, a generational change. It's, it's a change that can have immediate impact. Yeah. Danielle, do you want to close us out? Sure, echo my colleagues. Um, when I was a kid, I used to ask my teachers all the time what life had been like for enslaved people. And I loved all my teachers, but they all told me we don't know and we can't know. And it has been a joy of my professional life to watch the historical profession change that. The research is so extensive that we have the voices of enslaved people from earliest years on. And over the last year, I've worked with colleagues to help design a fifth grade curriculum here in Massachusetts um, about enslavement made entirely out of the voices of people who were enslaved. And the texts go all the way back to the 1700s. So yesterday I got to participate in a workshop, um, leading a workshop with teachers around how do you teach hard histories? And the goal as we are working on this is to figure out how are you honest and empowering at the same time. And this is hard because for example, violence is a part of the story of enslavement. How on earth do you teach fifth graders about violence? And of course you don't want to do graphic things, gory detail, but you've got to be honest because enslavement was violent, right? So you've got to at least name that. And at the end of the day, we also asked this question. We asked we temperature check, how were people feeling? And there were lots of people in the room who wanted to express anxiety, lots of people expressing like, being overwhelmed at how hard it is to grapple with this history. There were also people who said they felt hopeful and inspired and encouraged. And it was actually in particular the African-American teachers who said that. Um, and that was really powerful to me, that they were seeing something change in the world around them, change in what was possible for them to do as teachers and educators. But they were also there ready to bring everybody else along with them to take from the blessing of the African-American experience, which is a depth of understanding about this country, and to share that with others and educate others and get us to a point where we can work together as co-processors of our history. So I saw those fifth grade educators doing that work together, and that is for me a great source of inspiration. Outstanding. Well, you all have been a great source of inspiration for me, and I know for all of our viewers today as well, I want to thank you, not just for this incredibly rich and powerful conversation about the tremendous challenges that we have uh, in helping us 
see a path forward and signs of hope, um, but for what you do each and every day to help make that a reality. And I want to thank all of our viewers for caring enough about these issues uh, to have tuned in. So thank you all very much. And uh, that concludes our program today. Thank you, Suzanne. Terrific conversation.